uh, channel for a while now, and it's been in solidarity uh, against violence against women in the name of rape, in the name of terrorism. Of course, today makes it 249 days after the abduction of over 200 Chiboggers from Bodu State. I'm joined now by President Woman Arise, and she's also the leader of the hashtag Rescue Our Girls Now, the brain behind that particular music you just saw. Dr. Joe Oke Odumaki, good morning, and good thank morning. you for joining us today. Thank you for your great job you are doing here. It looks as if the temple had died down. We've seen the hashtag bring back our girls, you know, it, it used to be on in the face of the media. 249 days after, what's the mood like for you? 249 days after, we still feel terribly disturbed because insecurity of lives and property that led to that sad event of April 14, where more than 219 of our guests were taken. And as I speak, even up to this moment, as a Sunday, December 14, with heavy hearts, the feeling and how terrible it has been. Somewhere in Gumsuri, December 14, when our youth had been at the forefront with their own weapons, referred to as vigilantes, for over one year, even when the terrorists went to Chibok, the youth had been repelling, had been resisting, the Boko Haram people. But that day, that Black Sunday, they came, and the attack was from the back of the village and the front. And more than 32 people were killed. Over a hundred women and children, and some of our young boys were taken. And as I speak, the tempo has not died down. We are still there. We still feel for these girls even several others that have been taken. We still feel that no matter what sacrifice that we have to pay, that there's no sacrifice that is too much in order for these girls to be rescued. And sad enough, about six of their mothers have died. Terrible enough for us. Sunday, more were taken. And the nature of the attack they used petrol bomb, sophisticated weapons. People were in, the few people that get testimony that escaped, people were in the house and they were throwing petrol bomb. They came in about five vehicles and over six hours. They came around 5.30 p.m. on Sunday. Over six hours, they were attacking the village and killing all of them. Just like they had told the leader, and unfortunately he's dead, the chief imam too, of Gumsri is dead, somewhere in Dakwa local government. So we can never forget them, but we need to do a lot more. Because these people are human beings, one human life. Human life remains sacred, and nobody has a right to take somebody's life. How much? But, okay, okay. Uh, sorry for cutting you short, but how much hope do you have? The last time we spoke about this, it said you are an incurable optimist. Mm. How much hope do you have that? After 249 days, these girls will be rescued. 249 days after. I just hate to think of it. That that state of helplessness will come. That is why I still hold on to that hope. 249 days. We can imagine a day in the midst of terrorists. Those people that we view through YouTube, their monstrous look, blood-sucking vampires, and having... Our girls, mothers, stay with them for 249 days is hellish. So, but I still have that hope. And I also hate to think of it when people ask me that the young girls that are on suicide mission, are they not the cheaper girls? I hate to think about that. I know being 249 days is enough to brainwash those girls. But I'm still hopeful. And that's it. Of hopelessness should not arrive. The citizens have to fulfill 
their obligations. And that was what led to those vigilantes, those our young guys that are ill-equipped. You know the type of gun that they have that is not sophisticated. They went all out in order for them to secure lives and property. But a year after, they did not succeed. And more than 32 of them, those are the numbers who can, some of them have been burnt, they can't even be counted. So I still hold on to that hope. And in hoping, we need to be more proactive. As soldiers that are dying every day, are human beings. Yes, we have heard that they've been equipped. They have to be thoroughly equipped. Their welfare should be taken care of. They have to be better insured. And situations where we have some of our youths now having to secure, because they see their mothers, their sisters just being taken away, and they cannot fold their arms akimbo and continue to organize. They have to organize for change. But in organizing, they need also to be properly trained. But that was the sad thing that happened. So like you've asked me, honestly, I'm still hopeful. I hate to think of it. At times, I think so much that I, I really have no strength in me. But I still hold on to that strength. That these girls, we can never let them go. And the other city, that Shekau, and the other, and this terrorist group, that audacity has led them. Even who can, of recent, the, the army of Khan was threatened. They refer to him as late. So you can see how, I, I mean, those people have are become so confrontational. It's because they know they have the sophisticated weapons. When they come to attack, they come in brand new vehicles. One of the vehicles that was seized was heavily, you know, it, 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 it was packed with weapons, that level of sophistication. So they come in brand new vehicles. They must have their sponsors. And those people, I want to say, like their leader has said, that they are ready to die. Beyond, so, beyond, beyond the efforts of vigilantes and Nigerians, concerned Nigerians who are being affected daily by this particular insurgency, what's your perception about the determination on the part of government? Because recently we've had the information center, Michael Mary, talk about how Nigerians have to be more security conscious in festive periods. We've also heard from the chief of the first staff who was giving Nigerians some kind of hope that the Nigerian army indeed are at the top of their game. Yes, um, talk is very cheap, although security remains a major challenge and it's a global trend. But Nigeria, to be specific, yes, we face a lot of security challenges, even within the army. We still have some of them that will be sympathetic to the terrorist group. Mm. And within our fold, we have those who are sympathetic. But in order for us to walk the talk, in order for us to be more proactive, we need to see our security. It's enshrined in our constitution. Security of lives and property remains paramount. And for us to hold on to government that serves as the umbilical cord, that serves as that governizing point that will help citizens to see that leeway to that hopeful environment, our security operatives must do a lot more. People have to be properly informed because lack of information. Look at where the terrorist group were attacked for almost six hours. There was the communication had been severed. So we need to do a lot more in terms of information. The security network, the information center must properly inform Nigerians. Our soldiers must be properly equipped because if the terrorist group know that they are ill-equipped, that is when they will have the other city, the air country, to come and attack us as a nation. Look at what happened to Umugwe. And as we speak today, yes, we knew what happened in the last Christmas period. When we have festive periods like this, you see that the terrorist group are also prepared in ensuring that they bring sorrow, tears, and blood. They go to mosques to attack, go to churches to attack, go to families to attack. So we need more assurance. Like I've always said that security issues should be a collective responsibility. It's extremely important for me to clap with one hand. I need to clap with both hands to get resounding applause. So all the security network, there must be proper networking. It must be proactive. People must be properly informed. Security operatives, those who are involved, must be insured because they know that when they are going out to fight. If anything happens, their family, their loved ones, their wives will not suffer. 
Let's break so all of this back on the later. Talk. Because I saw, I, I understand that the purview of your program is not just for the Chibo girls. You also talk about violence against women. And that is uh, very important at this time when we're talking about the participation of the women folk, even in electoral processes. How much job do you think has been done in stemming down the tide of the much talked about violence against women in Nigeria, especially in the Southwest where we are? Violence against women has been on the rise. According to the World Health Organization report, out of five women that we see, two of them have suffered violence in their lifetime. And those who perpetuate these heinous acts are those who are close, family friends, husbands, wives, mothers. And when such art is perpetrated, mm. the person that is close will continue to exploit the, that opportunity because you see the person daily. That person will continue to taunt that person. We keep that person depressed. And even in a political sphere, this violence has been exported. As I speak, in terms of numerical strength, we have that we have about 49% of our population are women. Those who are involved politically is a far cry from the 35% affirmation. So we see that violence, thuggery, people are being killed, political motivated murders. Mm. And then a lot of people are not empowered. In terms of violence, there are people whose tongue serve as weapon of mass destruction. It's not the physical violence, but psychologically. And then they will taunt the person. So at the end of the day, if somebody wants to participate in politics, such a person will be psychologically traumatized because that person has been run down either by the opposite sex or those that belong to the other political party. So as I speak today, we need lots of encouragement. Uh, apart from that, there should be better awareness. Most of our women, and you see that violence against women has no class. Mm. Those that are in the low class, those that are pauperized, those that are super rich, some of them suffer in violence because they don't want to speak out. Well, so how do you balance uh, your provision for cure and management with the traditional values here in Africa? For instance, in the case of white battery, I learned in one of the uh, programs we attended recently where one woman said mm. that if your man beat you is never going to stop if it does it once then there's all possibility that it's going to do it again i mean how do we now keep the family or perhaps the marriage together in the case of violence against women yes there's that one the patriarchal culture one people believe that women should be seen and should not be heard yeah. apart from that those who are beaten and decide to keep mute if the person fails to speak out yes i was in this program when i saw the woman and the moment she decided to speak out that thing stopped a lot of people feel that they will be stigmatized no the moment one continues to keep mute that person will continue to suffer in silence and one day they will rest that person in peace but when that person speaks out, a culture that says when somebody loses the husband, you bring out the husband, clean his body, and give the wife that water to drink. That's right. A lot of people are suffering from ignorance. Mm. And so when one decides to speak out, that is when such a thing will stop. As soon as this woman spoke out, the beating stopped. Nobody sees her tomorrow. She's a clear testimony of wife battering, but now she's still luckily married to Debo, the husband, and the husband is now taking care of her. We have had terrible instances where people had been beaten, they reported, and then they decided the cultural way because of the children, because of what they were told in the church or in the mosque that they should endure and keep the family life. At the end, such people will lose their life. Look at what happened to Titlaya Aruolo. She was being beaten always. And she was giving excuses for the husband. Mm. At last, she was stabbed more than 89 times. So people should learn to speak out. And then we should also realize that marriage is not competition, but to complement each other. And in complementing each other, we all have to respect ourselves. I always say that out of 2,000 cases that we've documented of violence 
gender-based violence. Only two men came to report that they've been beaten by their wives. I was the going others, to get there because some are the, saying that the violence... Others mm -hmm. are, uh, uh, the others are just men. And beaten one of them, the day she came to report... Sorry, the, the, way the, the day the husband came to report mm. that he's always been beaten for six months and he sustained severe injury. As soon as the wife came, the husband ran under the table. <laughs> he was so scared, Steve. And we then tried, because the percentage, maybe it's about 3%, mm. you know. And we tried to find out, why are you always beating your husband? The husband earns 7,005 as a security man. They have three children. Mm. When he's coming back from work, he would drink to stupor. And then you tell the woman, jump on the bed. Mm. Enjoy the woman in the name of love making and everything. So one day, the woman was so tired. And then how to beat the husband. So while he was beating, he cried and cried and slept off like a baby. So she then realized that if beating is the solution, so when the man comes at night and starts to terrorize, yes, I want to will beat and he will sleep off. So until the man came to a report, we were able to reconcile them. We empowered the woman, gave her some money, and started up business. And now was the doing... woman more physically endowed than the man? Uh, yes, at least that particular woman was physically endowed. So the other sent me this picture talking about the fact that violence has no gender and if you can look at this it's a woman actually be literally beating up a man yes in fact that was that was why i said that we've had two practical cases mm. of those that have come you know to reports the only thing is that is on the rise women suffer more. from it more but we'll have some of our, some of our men too will not want to speak out mm. they'll be slapped by their wives and they'll keep quiet and the beating will continue. Well, from your experience, would you say that victims have over time gotten justice? Because eventually when you take it to court and then you notice that um, probably they eventually do not get punished, so to speak. The thing is that impunity is on the rise. And a judicial process moves at that very snail pace. For instance, mm. rape. Mm. If somebody is raped, mm. And the person reports, immediately the person is raped, the person goes to the toilet, wash up the messy thing. As soon as it is washed off, that person has destroyed the evidence. So if such a thing happens, enlightenment, people need to know when somebody is raped, just leave it as messy as it is and go to a government hospital. It will then be seen, the person will be examined and it will be recorded. Once the person cleans up, the evidence had wiped off. Even when the other person is eventually arrested, there isn't much evidence that will be given. But in terms of this violence that we see, some of them are reported. But you see that several adjournments, for instance, Fatima Bankoli, that was beating one of the cases that we, ha we are still handling now. Why? She took the tail part of Titus Fish, and the younger wife reported to the husband that the fish meant for him. That's the tail part of the fish was the one the wife took. The husband came, started beating her, and she had 26 stitches on her face because of that fish. And after that, she was sent out of the house. Up to this moment, we are still in court. And the, the day the man, I mean, they had neighbors. Some of the neighbors were saying, serve your rights. I mean, for us to keep criminal silence, that's its, its conspiracy. But, but, but where does this put us now in a situation whereby those who had the guts and the confidence, the boldness, so to speak, to come out to report, uh, spend eternity at the court? Some of them will even come out and say, well, maybe we should drop this case because it's taking too long time. How do we balance that issue with people who need to make public uh, reportage about this? Let's take this call first, Doctor. This is Udo. Good morning. Good morning. Udo, if you're there, just go ahead with your contribution. Yes, we can. Very well. I'm afraid we lost that. When you call, the moment your call is acknowledged, please just go ahead with a contribution. How do we now balance these two extreme cases? Those that reported do not get justice eventually if they go to court, then how do those people in this mess get the encouragement? What way out for them? Yes, yeah, some, when they report, they might eventually get justice. But justice delayed is justice denied. We've had several cases 
that were reported. Mm -hmm. And then because of several adjournments, I still recollect the case of a woman in Shagam mm -hmm. that one political top shots, mm -hmm. one chieftain of a party, mm -hmm. beat the wife, smashed her head on the, on, on the glass, and she sustained severe injury. While the case was in court, this man went and married another person because they were not, I mean, they were not formally married. And the woman called and said she was giving up the case because of adjournment. One, she has reported, and everyone has known that she has reported. In fact, she was encouraged to withdraw the case. And we try as much as possible. We are not to separate families, but to reconcile families. But when we see that that person's life is... Is, is, there's a threat to such a person's life. That is when we cancel and we help in rehabilitating the person. So for those who fail to report, when they see those who have reported and they do easily get justice. So now as we speak, the judicial process must speed up cases of this gender Related Are there alternatives to the judiciary at this time? Many have talked about religious and family leadership coming into the case to settle the matter. Has there also yielded any result in recent times? Yes, we know that Nigeria is a deeply cultural society and we have our people exploring several alternatives. You will see that some of these women, it's not when they are beaten once that they will report some of them. Some of them still go, they go to their various churches, their mosques. They see their immediate family, they report. When that one fails, they go to the church, they go to various... They've been, they've been using alternative means. At times when some of them come to women and rights sectorials, we we'll, we'll have counselors, we we'll have lawyers, we we'll meet, we we'll invite the partner, especially when the case of that person is not life-threatening. If it's life-threatening, that person will go to the hospital first. We we'll have several life pictures of injuries that have been inflicted. Somebody driving hot iron into the, the wife's I main parts because he felt that the child that the wife had looked so much like the father. And the father and the son look so much alike. So now the father, the, the wife had the, had the child and he said the father was responsible. So while she was still recuperating from operation and you know these rooms that are not well ventilated, she slept, the way she slept, Electricity was installed, and the husband plucked iron hmm. and drove it inside her. Let's take this call from Worry. That's quite Victoria here, Doctor. Good morning, Good morning Sheriff. Sheriff. Uh. Sheriff, are you there? Okay. Uh, please, I want to ask uh, uh, the guest. What about the situation whereby? The, a man is being raped by women. What is what is going to be the action by the man? So I want the, uh, the, 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 the guest speaker to tell me exactly what that man should do. Because I've seen about two cases where they raped a man and the man fainted. Yeah, so that is my contribution. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Sherry, from Worry. Uh, like, like I've said that uh, gender-based violence at times men also suffer but the percentage is low but that's not to say one should ignore such thing if there's any clear case where you have a man being raped by women as soon as such heinous acts is perpetrated at the end if there is any room but the person might not be in such a situation to record anything so, but as soon as such an act is over, that man should go to the nearest government hospital, get to the doctor, report that he is being raped by women. He will be examined because at least there will still be that clear sign that that person has been raped. So, after such a thing has happened, that person should then go to the police station and report. Why reporting? Probably the person might have an idea of one out of several women that has engaged in such a rape. Okay. So it is reported, the police will soon we'll do the action the and then go and arrest the person. After that, our organization will take up such case because no matter what, 
anybody whose right is violated must get redressed. And we are ready, even if the person is a man, mm -hmm. in ensuring that that person gets justice. Well, rounding up now, let's just quickly bring all of this back to our major discourse for today. How does this violence uh, that women have suffered or that are presently uh, suffering in this climb impact on their participation in the general election, either to be elected or to vote for, so to speak? There is a sort of relative law in terms of participation okay. because of violence that I've made reference to. At times it's psychological, at times it's physical. I've known one very young lady that participated in the election, and when she came to meet me in the office, she tied some things right her arm and everything and said, yes, doctor, yes, they think that agree is, is what is, men have monopoly of it. Look at me now, I'm going to campaign and the rest. And I was shocked because she was a very, very quiet lady. So, <laughs> but we see that a lot of our women are scared stiff as a result of such violence. And then some of our women are looked up on, when, looked down upon. When they see a woman say, she's a prostitute, look at her, she's always there at night meetings. So nobody has a right to talk down on any person. Nobody has a right to keep somebody depressed. Where determination exists, failure can never dismantle the flag of success. So our women should be encouraged. Mm -hmm. They should know that they are the ones who can take their destiny in their own hands. And I also want our women to realize that their vote is their power. Just a they minute, Doctor. Let's bring this call from Russia as we begin to round up. Uh, that environment. We have uh, elderly people in that area. Someone like uh, Babangida, the head governor of that domain, the present governor of Bono, and other senior people in that particular environment. What are their efforts towards that particular problem that is happening in that particular area? Because people are watching them. We have, we don't have our people blame the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, agreed, because he's our leader today. But now, people in that particular environment, they know much more than that particular president. And they are from that particular area. I believe that the country are thinking. I'm afraid we lost that, but... Okay, sit there. What are the efforts? People are looking at them. People don't know that I have to come from that particular environment that once your leaders are raised in relation to this particular... or the problem of the Republic of Nigeria that you have no time. So people are watching these people. Because they are looking at them. 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 They are looking at Odette Doye, thank you very much for your contribution. Thank Calling you. in from Oshun. I'm sure he's talking about the abduction of the Chibo girls that we discussed earlier. We have to let you go now. Just one minute for the women folk there who would love to participate. What would you say to them as their role uh, in this forthcoming general election? As the forthcoming general election approaches, our women should realize their vote is their power. They yeah. must never lose it. Mm. Their vote is their voice. They must use it wisely. Let them be encouraged. They are the only ones who can take their destiny in their own hands. I want to assure them that as much as possible, insecurity of lives and property that has become a recurring decimal, that all will be done to look into it. And they should know that they must not continue to agonize. They must organize for change. And in that change, their vote must count. Dr. Joe Kildumake, President Woman Arise, as well as being the leader of the hashtag Rescue Our Girls Now. Thank you very much for joining us today. Pleasure. On Call Digest. We hope that you join us also subsequently thank in you. all of this public discourse. A big thank you to the viewership of the show today. A big thank you to my production crew, my producer, Manuel Ajayi. Udo called in. Uh, we had a dropped call. We hope that you call again next week, Monday. Sherry called from Wari, Odedui from Moshon, Larry from Ondo, Joseph called earlier from Abuja, as well as well as Abdul Aziz, who called from Elore. And that wraps it on Cold Ideas this week. Uh, don't forget to be a part of Cold Ideas Extra tomorrow. Kickstart at 9 o'clock. Promises to be a lighter and more, much more uh, exciting edition of the show. I am Lee Febi Ogunto. Stick around for the top of the hour news. Don't go away. You can now watch Call TV much, News man. live from anywhere in the world on our website, www.calltvnews.com. Click on Live TV on our website and watch us live. And welcome to Cool TV Primetime News. To follow us on Twitter.
click on Twitter icon on our website. And Facebook, click on the Facebook and YouTube to see all our previous news production. You can also watch us live on YouTube. Click Core TV, leave a space, then news. Core TV News, a 24-hour news station.